guys I'm not really feeling well today so if I have to get up and leave unexpectedly that's probably why you gotta go you gotta go in all seriousness to my women out there fighting endometriosis every single day we're the real MVPs in this town the show must go on huh you like that? Hey there guys, my name's Megan if you're new here and if not, welcome back for episode 37 of Killer Weekend where each week we'll discuss a true crime case and you guys can feel free to leave your thoughts in the comments box below. Sounded a little bit like the grudge there but moving on. If you like all things true crime, supernatural, UFO, conspiracy theory and all that good stuff in between then please hit that subscribe button. I'll be here for you every Friday with our true crime killer weekends and on and off every couple of Wednesdays with our weirdo Wednesdays where we'll discuss something spooky I've heard. I will leave a small disclaimer at the beginning of this episode it does involve details of violent crime and also sexual assault. If that's a trigger point for you please turn away now. So how's everyone doing? Have you got a drink? I do. You're gonna need one for this case. Uh, that glass tastes like dishwasher. Oh. So before we dig right in there, I have something exciting that I would love to share with you. Last week I received a very generous bouquet from Rose Forever and it got me thinking, how many times have we sat and thought to ourselves, I wish my significant other would buy me more flowers? Now chaps, before we get it twisted, I'm not talking about a three pound bunch of carnations that still smell like premium unleaded from the local garage. No, I'm talking about a long-lasting gesture to show your significant other, your mum, your best friend, just how much they mean to you. Who can provide all this with just a bouquet of roses, you ask? I have the answer. Rose Forever are a New York based company that specialises in real rose long lasting floral arrangements. They also use natural scents and oils to ensure your arrangements stay fresher for longer. <sighs> Not only are they practical, but they look amazing. Whether you choose a velvet box or something glossy like their crystal option, you won't be disappointed. With three sizes to choose from and so many colour options, I'm sure Rose Forever will have something just perfect for your loved one. As you all know, I love everything dark, spooky and gothic, so I chose to go for the black roses in the black velvet round box. Perfect. And I will pop a link in the description box below for the exact arrangement that I have here today. If you're looking to purchase for your loved one today then please pop over to www.roseforever.com and use my discount code TRUECRIME15 for $15 off of your order. So my loves, it's me here to tell you about a case that petrified me when going into shopping malls or grocery stores, basically anywhere with a large car park. Most of us feel so so safe in busy and built up areas and why shouldn't we? Killers and these kind of monsters that we talk about every week only attack in the shadows and under the cover of darkness, right? Wrong. And you can be vulnerable anywhere at any time. And that's exactly what I learned from this week's case. So tonight everyone, we will be discussing the horrific murder of Kelsey Smith. Kelsey Ann Smith was born on May the 3rd, 1989 in Overland Park in Kansas. She was the third of five children. She had three sisters and one younger brother. Kelsey grew up super close to her mum, Missy, and her police officer, Father Greg. They were a really tight-knit family, and it was said that from a young age, Kelsey was extremely feisty. Kelsey was said to be a naturally creative child, and this would come into play in her later teens as well. In her teenage years, Kelsey attended Shawnee Mission West High School and she was said to be a fiercely loyal friend and she made friends so easily. Allegedly, if you were in a room with Kelsey for more than five seconds, you were leaving her best friend whether you liked her or not. Kelsey thrived in high school and she took part in several after school clubs, but this didn't stop her making time for her family. In fact, she would really enjoy spending time with her younger sister and her younger brother and would babysit them free of charge whenever her mother and father needed it. In those crucial years, Kelsey blossomed into a beautiful young woman. She had these deep brown soulful eyes and gorgeous, healthy, shiny, long brown hair. She was actually quite petite but quite athletic looking 
looking and her appearance caught the eye of another student, a boy called John Beersmith. Now John lived a little while away from Kelsey but he would always say that she made the drive worth it and yeah I definitely get those high school sweetheart vibes off of the two of those. In fact when they made it to their six month anniversary Kelsey had planned a nice surprise for she and John and they were going to hang out that evening. The relationship was said to have been pretty serious despite how young they were. In fact, John had actually purchased a promise ring for Kelsey. Even though they were heading off to college, he thought that he wanted to make that commitment to her then and there. Unfortunately for John though, he would never get to give Kelsey this special gift. At the age of 18, Kelsey was said to have led a quite busy and full life for someone her age. She had so many after school clubs that she was a part of, such as the school choir and also the local marching band, which meant that she developed an intense love for music. It was said that Kelsey had a gorgeous voice. In fact, she even won the solo whilst performing at a school function. When you think of the quintessential band girl or band geek, sorry if you're in the band, you do automatically think of braces and headgear and the big silly hats but I think that's probably just American movies that have done that to us. Probably American Pie is most likely to blame for that. This one time at Ben Camp but Kelsey, she totally broke that mold with her gorgeous girl next door looks and her amazing sense of humour. She had the whole package. Her girlfriends from high school would later say that Kelsey was extremely generous as well. She would often make them little balloon bouquets and gorgeous little gift baskets for each of their birthdays. And on Christmas, well don't even get Kelsey started, Christmas was her season. It was that loving and giving nature that led Kelsey to the Target Superstore on the 2nd of June 2007. Like I said, it was coming up to she and her boyfriend John's six month anniversary. I remember when you used to celebrate things like that. When you're four years deep, you don't even want to talk to each other. Kelsey had had a really good idea for her gift for John. She was going to make him a photo frame with a collage in it of all of their photos over the last six months. Something really personal and on brand for Kelsey. Grown up in Kansas, I'm pretty sure that Kelsey and all of her friends felt super safe. I mean, this is Kansas we're talking about, the land of Dorothy and Toto. But just like the plot of The Wizard of Oz, this story has its villain too. Kelsey arrived at the Target at around 6.55pm that day. She wore her long brown hair in a loose wavy style. She also wore a pink vest top and black shorts along with white sneakers. As she wandered around the Target store, she phoned her mum Missy to double check where she would find the frames within that particular shop. You see, Missy was in Iowa at the time attending a friend's son's wedding so she wasn't there to guide her daughter in the massive superstore. Missy informed Kelsey of which aisle she would find the photo frames in and said her goodbyes to her daughter. Little did Missy know this would be the last time she would ever speak to Kelsey. On CCTV in the Target store, Kelsey can be seen walking to the checkout with her items and she walks out of the store at around 7.07pm. She makes her way over to her silver greyish Buick Regal car and heads off out of the car park. But remember this, because this footage would be the last known sighting of Kelsey Smith. And after this, did she simply vanish into thin air? When John Beersmith, Kelsey's boyfriend, arrived at her home for their special date night, he was a little bit weirded out that she hadn't arrived home yet, but he thought maybe she had just been running late. She had only left for the store around 10, 15 minutes before he was supposed to get there. So he waited and after a little while when she didn't turn up, he started to get pretty concerned. He started texting her, calling her, no answer. He then asked her sister to text and call her yet again no answer. This was extremely strange for Kelsey because for all intents and purposes she was said to be an extremely mature and responsible young woman. Her mum would even go on to say that she would never ever leave her family wondering where she was. Even if she was going to be five minutes late she would pick up the phone and call. Not me. When I was 15 I used to leave my mother wondering where I was for hours. A serial killer's wet dream. Sorry mum. As time ticks by with no response from Kelsey her 
her sister decides to call their mother Missy. Now Missy hasn't heard anything from Kelsey since she spoke to her on the phone while she was in Target but she should have been back by now. She was getting ready to go to the checkout when Missy hung up the phone. Missy tries to call Kelsey back but to no avail and at this point she is currently on her way back from Iowa to Kansas and she herself is starting to stress. As Kelsey's dad Greg is a police officer he kicks into high gear and starts calling around local hospitals, local dispatchers, using his resources to try and get a hold of his daughter. Maybe she's been in an accident, maybe something's happened to her car and she's had to call roadside assistance. But Kelsey was like a ghost, Greg could get no information on her. And at this point, Greg was in full Liam Neeson dad mode. Kelsey's family and friends drove around town looking for her, hoping to get a sighting of Kelsey or her car and to no avail until at around 11 p.m. when Kelsey's grandparents ran into her car, her Buick Regal sitting in the car park of a Macy's directly across from the target she was last seen in. They informed Greg, Kelsey's police officer father, and thank goodness he had his brains on that day because he told them that no one was to go near the car. And this is something we don't see very often, you know, we said it in the Springfield 3 case and also in the Jean Benet Ramsey case when people just start cleaning crime scenes. The FBI got involved pretty quickly and from the get-go they felt like this was a case of foul play. Now as I said at the beginning of this episode we all feel kind of safe in built-up areas but statistically many people are assaulted and abducted from retail car parks all across the world every single year. In fact, a story that will make any parent's blood run cold, only three weeks ago in Largo in Florida, a 24-year-old man, if we're even calling this weasel a man, saw a 14-year-old girl sitting in a car with her family in the car park of a Walmart. Whilst her parents were literally in the car with her, the man proceeded to reach through the open window and physically try and grab the 14-year-old girl out of the car. Luckily the 14 year old is able to wriggle away from 24 year old creepster Austin Eilert and she manages to roll up the window just in time in which he decides to run away on foot but he was apprehended by law enforcement. It does make one wonder how terrifying would that have been for not only the child but for their parents the absolute audacity to do it in front of them and not only this if he's this bold with this kind of crime is this a first child that he's abducted and possibly what would have been this young girl's fate if he had managed to steal her from her parents' car. It's also a well-known fact that Ted Bundy would peruse car parks and pretend to have a broken arm so that young women would help him with his groceries and he could chuck them in the back of the car. Whilst we're on the subject of that, Ted Bundy is not hot, okay TikTok, so stop trying to make it happen. It's not going to happen. As investigators believed that Kelsey had met with someone who had sinister intentions for her, they knew that the race to find her alive would be on. Kelsey's boyfriend John had an uncle at the time who worked for a telephone company and he had heard about some new technology that would allow law enforcement to track Kelsey and her phone potentially. We now know location services to be extremely useful. In fact, only in 2018, it was used to track down a young abducted woman. In the January of 2018, a 19-year-old woman was abducted from a Belgium nightclub by five men in a van. I'll say it once and I'll say it again. If you're not a tradesman selling ice cream or in a rock band, you have no business having a van. The young girl was held and brutalised for over three days until she was able to send her location to her brother. Another young woman's story, Jyla Gladden's, will give you absolute goosebumps. 21 year old college student Jyla nipped out to her local shop just to get some bits and bobs for the night. After picking up a couple of groceries, Jyla made her way across a very well lit car park to her car, in which she was accosted out of nowhere by a man carrying a knife. The man forced Jyla into her car at knife point, in which he then proceeded to drive them to a secluded area where he assaulted the 21-year-old student. After the assault, Jyla was terrified and had no clue as to what her abductor's intentions would be for her, but I think we can probably guess they wouldn't have been good. She was then forced to drive him to a local gas station, in which he proceeded to try and rob the gas station and when he was unsuccessful 
successful, he asked Jyla to find another one for him. This is when Jyla, quick thinking, decided to ask her kidnapper for her phone so she could use Google Maps to locate another gas station. Shockingly enough, he handed Jyla her phone in which she was then able to send her location to her boyfriend. It seemed like from the text exchange between Jyla and her boyfriend Tamir, initially he actually thought she was kidding until he saw that she was pinged one hour away from her hometown. Her attacker was then tracked the whole way to the next gas station and finally apprehended where Jyla was rescued safely. This is only a couple of instances in which technology has saved someone's life. See, so it's not all bad. Don't believe everything you watch on Black Mirror. Unfortunately for Kelsey and her loved ones, this was 2007 and her phone provider Verizon at the time claimed that they did not have this tracking technology. Law enforcement and Kelsey's parents would later go on to allege that Verizon were extremely reluctant in assisting police's investigation, which unfortunately cost the investigation and Kelsey crucial hours. It turns out that this particular phone company had actually opted out of this feature as a way to cut financial costs and therefore leaving thousands of their customers unprotected in these circumstances. From what investigators initially saw on the Target CCTV footage, Kelsey's shopping trip looked fairly uneventful that day. However, as FBI experts slowed down the footage and enhanced it, it began to yield a horrifying secret. As Kelsey innocently pulled into the Target car park at around 5 to 7 p.m. that night, you can actually see a dark coloured pickup slowly driving behind Kelsey. As Kelsey walks through the doors, she is shortly followed by a tall man with dark hair wearing a white t-shirt, black shorts and a pair of black sneakers. The man would slowly follow her behind coincidence but it didn't appear like the man was shopping because instead of looking at the shelves his eyes were fixed on Kelsey. Kelsey can be seen making her way to the till point to pay for her items in which at this point the man hurriedly leaves out of the front exit. He doesn't buy anything and he doesn't take anything with him. At 7.07pm it initially looked like Kelsey left the shops with her items, headed into her car and drove out the lot safely. But with the new enhanced images, Kelsey's fate became clearer and much darker. The footage showed Kelsey approaching her car when out of nowhere a blur flashes across the screen. Now it's really subtle as if you blink you miss it but it is there. As investigators rewind and replay and slow the video down it becomes more clear that this is no speck of dust, no camera glitch, this blur is a person. The case has now taken a horrifying turn. It becomes clear that Kelsey was abducted right there by her car in the Target car park and no one saw a thing. The FBI and local law enforcement then make a public appeal to the man who was seen following Kelsey in Target. Who is this man? And if he has nothing to hide, would he come forward? During this time, FBI agents and Kelsey's parents were in an infuriating battle still with the provider of Kelsey's cell phone. At first, you'll remember, they said that they didn't physically have the technology to track Kelsey's cell phone then and there. And then when they were informed that they could track previous text messages and calls to her last known location and make almost a grid search from that, they weren't willing to because of data protection. Even though the phone was purchased, by Kelsey's mum and dad. This actually led to a four day delay in any information being provided about Kelsey's whereabouts. When Verizon finally did decide to cooperate with law enforcement, it only took 45 minutes for them to create a grid of Kelsey's phone's last known whereabouts. 45 minutes which made the discovery on June the 6th, 2007 at 1.30pm that much more devastating for her family. On that fateful afternoon, an FBI agent and a technician from Verizon went out to find Kelsey's phone. They managed to track it to some woods in Missouri on the Kansas City border. However, investigators got more than what they bargained for when they not only found Kelsey's cell phone, but her remains. 19-year-old Kelsey Smith was deceased. According to her autopsy, she'd been strangled 
dangled using the belt from her movie theatre uniform that she often kept in her car. The condition of Kelsey's body would suggest she was sexually assaulted and this was later confirmed in her autopsy. I will say that what happened to Kelsey is absolutely disgraceful and there are certain details of this case that I will out of respect for the family not even mention on camera. The FBI profilers on Kelsey's case were certain that her crime was sexually motivated and if this person was left to run free, he would definitely strike again. But who was he? Remember, all FBI investigators had was a little bit of grainy CCTV footage and even so, we still didn't know if this person seen on the camera was actually Kelsey's abductor. Granted, he was a little bit steady, but is that illegal? Whoever this man was, he wasn't coming forward and when it looked like this case was going to lead investigators down a dead end, they received a phone call. A couple who lived in the Kansas area claimed that they believed the man on the CCTV footage was in fact their next door neighbour. They actually laughed off when they first saw it on the news. That was until they heard the description of the man's vehicle, a dark pickup truck, when in fact their neighbour drove a dark pickup truck. That's when the couple realised that this was no case of mistaken identity or perhaps a doppelganger. This in fact was their neighbour, a Mr Edwin Hall. Edwin R Hall was born in 1981 in Kansas. It was said that he had quite a troubled upbringing and was quickly placed into the foster care system as a toddler. He was adopted at the age of seven in 1988 by a Carol and Don Hall via a newspaper ad. The 80s were a very strange time. One baby please. Despite Carol and Dawn's efforts in providing Edwin with a happy and healthy home life, he was unfortunately a very disturbed young boy. At the age of 15, he was actually arrested for threatening his adoptive sister with a kitchen knife. At this point in his life, Edwin was actually exhibiting other strange behaviours, such as an attack on a schoolboy with a baseball bat. This dude wasn't showing little red flags here and there. He was a giant red flag himself. We would all hope that after his arrest he was given the mental health care that he required but obviously he wasn't because this was the 1990s. Instead of being given the therapy he clearly needed he was actually placed back into the foster care system until the age of 18. At the age of 19 alone abandoned and longing for a family unit Edwin met a woman named Aletha. But even though Edwin had a new wife and a new life he was far from being rehabilitated because at the age of 23 he was charged with having sexual intercourse with a 14 year old girl. Now let's just get this out in the open. If a grown ass man bothers himself with a 14 year old girl like this, that is called rape. That is called grooming. It's not sexual intercourse because it can't be consensual. Now to set the scene a wee bit about the relationship between Aletha, Edwin's wife and he, she decided that after this she wanted to stick with him and also have a baby with him. Stand by your man. Edwin's neighbours said that he was quite a quiet guy, kept himself to himself, never really bothered anyone but there was still those continuous red flags. One being the fact that he got all of his neighbours to call him Jack, okay? He also had a very worrying online presence under the alias of Jack. Jack's MySpace page actually featured photos of Edwin and his young son. Not only this, it had a link to his partner Aletha's MySpace page. Probably the most worrying aspect of his site would lie in the section named Interests, which listed eating small children and harming small animals. Okay, I'm just gonna say it. We saw this kind of look at me energy during the Jasmine Richardson case as well. It's like, can anyone just say shopping anymore? Listening to Fleetwood Mac, Painting my nails? No? Okay. Edwin's vehicle would also match the pickup truck saw on the CCTV footage at the Target Superstore. He seemed to be getting backed into a corner and not only this, he had left a little souvenir at the crime scene. The CSI team had found a fingerprint on Kelsey's driver's seatbelt that did not belong to Kelsey or any members of her family. When tests were ran on this, it was a match 
for Edwin Hall. Conveniently, when officers moved in to arrest Edwin on the 6th of June 2007, he and his wife were packing up for a vacation. Upon his arrest, investigators searched the home that Edwin shared with his wife and his four-year-old son, and what they found was most damning. The shorts that Edwin had wore to the Target store that day had still not been washed by his naughty naughty missus, and Kelsey's DNA was found on the zipper of his shorts. The chance of this being anyone but Kelsey's DNA was apparently 1 in 280 billion. Upon his arrest, Edwin did ask for a lawyer and wasn't willing to answer any of investigators' questions. That was until he was met with a large amount of evidence coming his way. Edwin was also informed of an eyewitness testimony from a couple who had been in the area that Kelsey's body was buried the day after her murder. They said that they saw Edwin emerging from the woods and they were actually quite startled. Now I don't blame them because he literally looks like one of those blob fishes. A face only a mother can love. Oh actually. The couple claimed to have seen Edwin's pickup truck full in the back with branches and said that he emerged from the woods carrying branches himself. Police do believe at this point that that was Edwin's way of trying to conceal Kelsey's body so it would remain undiscovered. Edwin Hall was then charged with the murder, kidnap, rape and sodomy of Kelsey Smith. Because of the severity of this crime, he would be eligible for the death penalty. But unfortunately, we had that snatched away from us when Edwin decided to shock everyone by pleading guilty. Through Edwin's testimony and crucial evidence, investigators have come up with an idea of what they think happened to Kelsey that day. It was said that Edwin either saw Kelsey when driving on the road and followed her into the car park at Target. At this point, he waited in his car until he saw Kelsey entering the Target shop. When he followed her in, his eyes were fixed on Kelsey as he was clearly stalking his prey. Edwin said that when he saw Kelsey up close for the first time in Target, he thought she actually looked a lot younger. In fact, he said she had the face of a 12-year-old. Monster. Absolute. Beeping monster. He then noticed that Kelsey was quite slim, quite athletic and had quite long legs. He said at this point that's when he knew he had to have her. I can imagine in everyday life a girl that looked like Kelsey probably wouldn't look at blob face Edwin and with good reason so he decided to attack her. As Kelsey pays for her items, Edwin then heads out of the store to lay in wait. When she puts the items that she's bought for her boyfriend in her passenger side door, she then makes her way around to the driver's side. Edwin then comes up to her with a gun in his hand. It's an air gun and Kelsey thinks that her life is now in danger. He forces Kelsey into the car, at which point he still has the gun facing the back of her head. He forces her to drive to the secluded area in Missouri, in which he then commits this terrible act. Kelsey's family listening back to what he did to their poor daughter, their friend, their sister, said that Kelsey was a bright crayon in the box of life and she had no business being stolen like that. Kelsey's family and friends during his sentencing wore blue t-shirts with her face personalised on the front. As Edwin had pled guilty, he narrowly missed the death penalty but was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. As the verdict rang out, her family and friends hugged and cried, just thankful that this terrible ordeal was over. But was it really over? Remember, all of the issues that her family and friends faced when trying to get her cell phone data from Verizon. This isn't how investigations should go and it's certainly not how Kelsey's should have gone. Had her phone been able to be tracked, there is a small chance that Kelsey's life could have been saved. Due to their experiences during the investigation, Kelsey Smith's family have worked tirelessly to have the Kelsey Smith Act put into legislation in the instances of missing persons, this means that they would not have to wait for a court order or for several days for that data to become available. This is an absolutely life-changing law and it's amazing the work that our family have done in the legacy of Kelsey. I hope you all liked this week's episode. If you did, please give it a big thumbs up for me. If you're feeling super fancy, then please hit that notification bell so you don't miss any of those upcoming episodes. If this is your first time watching, 
watching and you're thinking, well, I could watch it again, she's okay, then please hit that subscribe button. I'll be here for you every Friday with our True Crime Killer Weekends and on and off every couple of Wednesdays with our Weirdo Wednesdays. If you want to follow me, not home or to the supermarket because we've established that's strange on instagram at megan true crime you can also follow me over on tiktok at megan dot true crime i hope you all have a beautiful and safe weekend and please remember guys lock your doors don't talk to strangers and don't stick by men who murder women and hurt children because that's what edwin hall's wife has done see ya